bring in the next millions of people on chain is truly something I'm interested in. Why did you choose to build a gaming protocol? We saw the big announcement from Telegram with USDT becoming natively on the chain. That's going to be huge, but gaming is going to change the life of so many people. Louis Regis, the founder and CEO at Xborg. The world's largest player identity protocol in the gaming world. What is Xborg if you had to explain it to your mother? So what we do is we building your online CV. The number of games you've played, the number of kills you've made on a specific game, we combine into one specific tool, which we call the Xborg ID, your online CV, if you want. Why is it so valuable to have an identity online? It's a proof of identity. If your identity is tied to your profile, you know, okay, this person is legit because he has such and such accounts connected and different communities vouch for him. So I know as a game developer, this person is legit, he's not abusing my game. What does it take to make money trading in crypto? So you have to be able to understand who is leading the narratives and understand how the capital flows. What's the truth about exchanges and exchange listing? The truth is like most of the tokenomics you see online today are guided by exchanges. But the exchanges have huge leverage over you. That's been my biggest disappointment in crypto. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? Um, I think meme coins are What's your ultimate goal with Xborg? 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel? Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests, and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development, and community events. Amazing, man. Welcome to the podcast. Well, yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's been some time we've been talking and it's great to be able to make this happen. Who are you? Um, I guess uh, Louis, I'm French, uh, 26. Been in crypto for quite some time. You know, for the, I guess, the best part of my life was just studying uh, initially hospitality. Then I've came to understand what finance was and then came to understand what crypto was and, and how big crypto was to finance and could disrupt the space. And then that's, I would say, when it all started. So I got super deep down the rabbit hole 2017 to 2021 onwards, more so as a you know, uh, trader, uh, big, big meme coin participants, and then came into the, the builder side in 2022 with Xborg. Um, so yeah, I guess the person I am is today super committed to the crypto space, very passionate about the space, about building and adding value to the space. And then yeah, on the side, just, I guess, addicted to crypto. Uh, <laughs> trading. Like we all are. Well, you know, to, <laughs> to be honest, my life these days is just 100% crypto. From, and some gym here and there. Yeah, and, and, and gym, and gym <laughs> running. Um, but that's, um, yeah, crypto, as you know, is very consuming. Absolutely. You studied um, hotelry in uh, EHL, right? Ecole Hotelière de Lausanne. Yeah. So you have a hotelry and business background. Your first year there, I know that because my ex-girlfriend, my sister, they all went to hotelry school. The first year you spend literally cooking yeah. and you know making beds and all that stuff, right? So you start with that, but you're building a crypto gaming company now. Like, how is that even possible? Um, you know, I think that's my mindset of um, sort of anything you you want to do is uh, somewhat achievable. Um, you know, first year at, at, at that school, you have an internship. Uh, funny enough, that internship was in Abu Dhabi. Mm. So, you know, we, we, we're actually here in Dubai, but like um, Abu Dhabi and Dubai is roughly the same in terms of workforce. And I was very, uh, you know, I was the, at the really bottom of the ladder working with Indian people, you know, Filipinos, people that now serve, you know, us essentially, the guy that deliver food, etc. And, you know, I came to understand that uh, it's not really the life I want to live. And um, I also came to 
understand you have to be very humble because, uh, you know, no matter your outcome today, you know, sometimes you can have bad days, but if you compare it to other demographics, uh, it's, it's, you know, I guess it's a whole lot different. And, you know, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from this, just working super hard because the experience that these guys go through and that I went through was, was very intense. And then from that point onwards, whether, you know, I came to understand that nothing can actually is out, out of reach today. Like you can, you know, I came from learning nothing about coding to actually, you know, coding, um, actually the first platform we built at Expo, I was the only developer in this. I also came to contribute to like some large DeFi protocols like MakerDAO or like some other smaller protocols. And mm -hmm. that came just purely out of, um, I guess, just hard work and being very curious and uh, yeah. There's something in Europe, Switzerland, Singapore. It's less the case in the uh, US and UK, but I would say like in countries that are known to be a bit le where people are taking less risk, which is whatever you study is going to define your career, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, oh. And I guess the thing I've learned is like the... the 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 biggest risk you can take is not taking risks and you know we to me the um, you know having no 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 choice but to follow a given career path was super depressing to me um like having your normal 9 to 5 although it's suitable to a lot of people to me it was just i i could not do it and so i had to find ways out of this and I think if you look at some of the opportunities you have out there, um, learning how to code to me was sort of boring freedom um, because it's it's today it's something that's hugely in demand. And I knew following like a carry path in hospitality, it's uh, first you know everything is 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 in real life like you have nothing online, so you were bound to go to that nine to five. And to, to me, you know, quickly came to realize that true freedom can only be achieved. In my opinion, it was being achieved via being online, and closest path to getting there was okay. Software engineering is going to be super important, mm. and that's how I came to learn it. Basically, leverage, right? You want to build a certain type of leverage. Nav yeah. Naval, Ravikant talks about yeah. that, right? There's a uh, four main forms of leverage: uh, human capital. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the least efficient yeah. or least good one because yeah. in the more you hire the more you can kind of scale yourself, but it's kind of hard. You need to manage a lot of people. Then you have financial leverage, mm -hmm. which is also kind of like, yeah. I mean, it's what there is a lot in finance, which is why people do make a lot of money, but it's also kind of not the new types of leverage. And then mm -hmm. you have code and media. Media is basically yeah. what we're doing here, right? Yeah. Um, and then coding. Yeah, and I think the the, the bigger picture is I, uh, from 18, I started my first company, and quickly came to realize if you don't know how to code, um, you'll be limited. And that's why I refer to freedom is because if I want to start a new project now, obviously I can't do the next like AWS, like, you know, they, there is a, a degree to which I'm not competent, but like I'm doing any virtually any kind of marketplaces or, or like just, you know, just basic computer science, I can do it. And back when I was 18, it was super... I was super limited because every idea I had, although they were great, I could not execute on them. Or it was like super hard to find someone that you could trust. And then you always had bottlenecks or like you would go to an agency and be like, yeah, yeah, I wanna, I wanna do this startup and then it's gonna cost you this much and this much. So at, at one point I was like, you know, I'm very tired of this. I just wanna do my own things. And then you come to realize it's actually not that hard. Um, with the tools we have online, it's, um, and now we have like chat GPT and all. It's like, it's become super easy to actually do this stuff. Do you think it's possible to outsource the technological part when yeah. you start a company? Well, you know, you've discussed about leverage. I think if you want to have some big leverage, um, you have to have your in-house um, capabilities of building technologies. Because mm. most likely when you, when you build your own stuff, first attempts will be a failure. So going through an agency, they're not very agile. Um, and they're not, their interests are not aligned. 
Yeah, they want to make the money yeah, yeah. and then be it's, it's, done as quickly as yeah. possible. It's um, of course. It's I would say if you're non-technical, that's somehow the lowest hanging fruit. But then all of the companies I've, I've seen doing this, then they come to a stage where either don't have capital, so they can't pursue any technical developments, or the f the things that they've built was just not great, and then they're stuck. Um, mm. And uh, when I look to invest in projects, I would never invest in a project where it's outsourced, because you're you know first of all you invest in the in the people behind. Mm. So if they can't ship the product and do it fast, usually agencies are very slow. Uh, plus the code they ship is of, of bad quality. So yeah, to me it's a no-brainer. You should just do it yourself. You love to trade. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. And I guess made a lot of money in trading, and then. Um, what do you mean by a lot of money? I, yeah, I guess enough to not be able to you know care about working anymore. That's uh, that's what I would qualify as as big money. So the interesting thing is you started as a investor or as trader, which is what a lot of people start in crypto, yeah. right? And then you came on the building side, right? Yeah. I think it's a, it's a kind of natural path for a lot of people in the industry. Yeah. Uh, Luke Belmar was saying the same. Basically, first cycle, you go there, you do your mm -hmm. thing, you get wrecked. Second cycle, you kind of invest yeah. or trade. That's Trading much harder, but and you make some decent money. And then third cycle, you realize, mm. oh man, if I'm a builder, that's where the yeah. massive upside is. And also, you're doing something that's useful, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the, in the early days... Um, I think the, the the biggest run was like 2021, BSC days. That mm -hmm. was insane. Actually, yesterday I met someone I, I, I was chatting with on Telegram and we exchanged Telegram contacts. I did not know him in, in, in person. And then we were in this super niche alpha group with like 26 people. And I met this guy in real life and it was just crazy. But um, yeah, it says... BSC had like amazing opportunities where you could put in a thousand bucks next day. You know, one one day I was like up 36x in just one day. It was like, you know, damn, like what kind of opportunities That's are there? That's on Binance Smart Chain. Yeah. 2020, 2021. Yeah, that was that was the that was the most insane run. And I've I've seen it just a complete madness. And how, how similar is what we see on Solana now with no, the no, BSC days? Well, Solana is very concentrated towards meme coins. Mm. BSC was completely, like, it was complete insanity. It was, you know, it, to me, it's like at least an order of magnitude, like 10x, what we saw on Solana. Um, it was, the early days were, I, I don't think we ever going to see something like this, where you literally had, I mean, I started with like, you know, 10,000 bu 10, bucks and scaled that up to some crazy multiples and that was all on BSC. Mm. Um, but initially, like I, I'm not, um, so my, my background after this this university was traditional finance. So I really wanted to understand finance um, because I, I do think that part of being free is, is being financially free. Because mm. uh, then you can do, or, or at least you don't have to, to be bound to other persons and, and be stuck to your nine to five. And, and to me, that's contrary to freedom. But I'm, I was not bound to be a trader. Like I'm, I'm not actually trading the stocks market. It, it's just, I saw the opportunities and I also saw that there is huge asymmetries in the market. Um, if you know the market, the, like the ins and outs of the market, and you get to understand it, you get to understand the flow of capital they are truly exceptional opportunities where it's not risk-free, but they are opportunities like that gives you a certain edge and where you 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 can have the best returns on, on any market. Um, what does it take to make money trading in crypto? Uh, because there is a huge... Uh, I think most people, they join that thinking, that's, hey, I'm how I'm going to live my nine to five and or I can go to the beach or I can just work from Bali or whatever, but like almost no one makes money trading in crypto. We have to be very honest. Yeah. So what does you, it take to make money trading crypto? I think first is you have to um, lose it. Uh, to, to, to understand what, what it is that you, that yeah, you can eventually lose. Um, 
I saw your, your podcast um, where you're talking about BitMEX, you know, something similar happened to me. But you have to understand that first, uh, you have to be very humble to the market. Market can take you, take anything from you in at any moment. Um, you know, Bitcoin going to zero tomorrow could happen. Um, you know, if you have like a nuclear war, everyone could be deleveraged and we would all just, I guess, be down to zero if, if you have leverage. But then you come to understand it's a lot of work. Um, mostly today, the, how the, the, the flow of capital can be, uh, can be understood is on, on crypto Twitter is um, there are huge influencers that um, essentially direct the market. Um, and so you have to be able to understand like who is leading the narratives um, and, and, and understand how the capital flows. So for example, recently the flow of capital was really directed to um, by events. So for example, um, the AI tokens did super well close to the NVIDIA earnings, mm. um, but also to the GTC conference, which is the, the largest AI conference. You also have um, gaming tokens that were doing very well up to um, the GDC uh, conference. And I think part of being very good at crypto is understanding how the capital flow, at least in this part of the cycle, because that you know we refer to like um, sort of PVP, we don't have retail investors yet. So it's mainly the same sophisticated investors that go from one project to the other. So if you want to have- How can you say that we don't have retail investors yet? Well, you have metrics like um, uh, Coinbase ranking um, mm. is, 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 is nowhere near where it was. Um, you, you look at the number of views on, on YouTube of like particular influencers, um, retail so is just simply not there. And you don't have, we don't have remotely any kind of euphoria outside of a meme coin market. But a meme coin market is, was purely directed by sophisticated Sophisticated market participants, not uh, you know, not the the normies. Um, Do you want to elaborate on meme coins? Well, do you think meme coins are a flavor of the month, a flavor of the cycle, or a new digital asset class? Um, you know, I think meme coins are very. So I have a lot of respect for meme coins. Um, Shib was my best trade ever. <laughs> That's why you have a lot of respect. <laughs> And well, no, you have to, I think the, what you come to realize is you have to stay very humble. It's like you took something out of the markets, you, you, you need to understand the market can take it back from you anytime. And you, you see it, we had like a, a huge deleveraging events. Um, and I saw a lot of, of, of friends that are like some of the biggest traders, you know, some managing more than nine figures, uh, well, like nine or like mid nine figures and just got completely blown up on 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 like actually just a few few days ago. I think meme coins, at least the the, the way I view it this mark uh, this market is is saying we're tired of the usual VC um, VC setup where you have a low float. VCs at the end of the day are the ones that win and plus the team. Um, so to me, meme coin is a is a movement where you're saying. Retail investors, it's like the people's coin. It's like the mm. retail investors can actually win. Um, and, and that's why I, I like meme coins. It's, it's very fair to a degree. Is now, it? Is it really? Because um, I had look at it on the podcast yesterday. We talked about how even a lot of these projects, meme coin included, he was like, man, I can't tell people out loud what's going on behind the scene, but it's disgusting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, it's... Um, so, well, funny enough, um, not sure I can actually mention it, but I had a conversation during Token 2049 with a, a team that wanted to launch a big token, a big meme coin with like, it, it's likely going to be the biggest meme coin on a, on, a, on, a, on a fairly known L1 that has no big meme coin yet. And uh, so we'll be able to discuss about the inner works of this. Um, but coming back on just meme coins, I think those are interesting. Uh, an another reason for it is um, the way the SEC is going after securities. I think if you look at meme coins, at least the way people view it, is these will not be qualified as, as securities, at least for the most part. There is a big chunk of, of, of meme coin projects that are completely rigged, um, and we'll discuss about this. Um, but you know, I think, like for example, Doge, 
there's a, a pretty high likelihood of Doge getting an ETF just because there is no argument for Doge to be considered a security mm. because there were no initial token offering. Um, and lastly, what I will say on meme coins is to me, this reflects how aggressive or how risk on the market is at the moment. So to me, it's an index, almost like you could view the, the NASDAQ as a proxy to risk on demands in the traditional markets. I think meme coins is... If meme coins go up, that means the market is willing to take some risks. So it's to me, it's a proxy to how risk averse um, or risk on a, a market would be. What would uh, people invest in if they were not super risk on in crypto? In meme coins? No, you're saying basically that meme coin is a benchmark of risk taking appetite, right? In crypto. Yeah. What? Would you see what would we see if the appetite was not big, not that big? Because I'm kind of tempted to challenge here a bit and say maybe I'm just dreaming, right? Say the big brains or the mid curves, let's say, <laughs> they would say, "Oh, look, yeah, meme coin is like the big. Uh, it's a proof that it's a risk appetite. That's huge, right?" Yeah. I would maybe say, hey, may maybe meme coin is becoming something like kind of new. Obviously, it's going to go through like booms and busts, but that might attract more interest from people mm. than the next AI coin or the next gaming coin or, yeah. you know, like, because yeah. you have to make all this research. As you said, there is VCs involved in most of them. You don't really have access to early yeah. deals. There is all these influencers. I mean, meme coins too, but like at some point... I'm just thinking, for me, I'm just thinking very simply. People love to play lottery, you know, right? Yeah. Or gamble since like many, many yeah. well, decades or probably, yeah. you know, more millennia. So meme coin is that, but it's much more fun. And therefore it might be just a new trend that started a bit with, uh, yeah. with uh, GameStop and then Dodge mm. and a couple yeah. of years ago, but now it's just... Yeah. Well, yeah, no, and I guess that makes sense. I think an argument for this is also crypto is inherently very complex. And um, people like to discuss about the next ZK infra or like, you know, parallel EVMs. And when people you People in crypto like that, but most of yeah, the others yeah, are like, man, like, what the fuck is that? So that's why, yeah, I mean, the average sort of market participant, like the, the, the retail investor, if you took like just basis trading or anything that's like sort of mid advanced in crypto, no one really understands. So Obviously. to them, like... At the end of the day, they end up following what influencers say. Um, and I think a big like, big portion of them then just end up being like, okay, I invest in meme coins. You know, my dad is a good example of this, where he would just trade the, those tokens. And he has like, you know, he's a dentist, um, sort of very stable life. And then he would just, because they assume crypto is anyway gambling, like, yeah, exactly. What's the, what's the, <laughs> exactly. you know, what's the, um, like meme coins is just another layer on top, but like. It's more fun, but well, yeah. It's also like, if you go in crypto <laughs> as a retail and like you want to, um, you're, you're there to actually make a lot of money. Um, like as, as a retail participant, sure there is a, 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 a chunk, they're like, okay, it's, it's going to give me better um, risk adjusted returns. So I need 1% of Bitcoin, but like <laughs> here talking, for example, but. <laughs> But my friends, like, they want to have the the best return. And so historically, just meme coins are the one that outperform. And so, sure, like, AI stuff is sexy, like, um, ZK, you know, ZK roll-ups or whatnot. I've... That's very sexy. But then <laughs> if they want the... And like, my, if, I, if my friends ask me, okay, what's the what's token that's going to yield the best return? It's likely going to be a meme coin. Now, oh, you're, taking, you're taking huge risks. But, like, if you were in... 2020, 2021, like Doge in one day went up like 7x. Yeah. It was a billion dollar token. Yeah. Like it's just crazy. Yeah, like I think to be extremely practical and honest to ourselves, most people don't understand most of these like layer ones, layer twos, even me to be very honest. And I interviewed yeah. most of these founders, yeah, but yeah. I'm like, yesterday again, Luca, he was like, man, all these layer ones, all these layer two, but we're not building anything. We're not building application yeah. that are used going to be used by people. We're just building this yeah. infrastructure here and there. And 
So, so people don't care. So like, especially in retail, so they're just going to come and YOLO. And what do you YOLO on? <laughs> Meme coins. And what's really interesting I, is I really see people who were early in NFTs, they understand this thing really well. Luca, Hadiatsu, and all these guys, yeah. they're like, yeah. But then I see big brains. I see Anthony, for example. I'm yeah. sure he's going to watch that. And he's been always saying, yeah, for me, I'm not really involved in that because he's almost too smart yeah. to kind of accept that you can, at huh. least for him, his own money, right? Yeah. Be like, oh, I'm going to invest in that because there's no kind of like, there's, there's yeah. nothing. <laughs> That's the thing. And it's, and it's probably why he's going to outperform, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I know Anthony does a bit, um, dabbles a bit, um, mm. but obviously not. You know, you don't you don't do you know half of your portfolio mm. uh, on this. So meme coin is this thing where it's supposed to be very very fair distribution, right? Which leads me to something I wanted to talk about because you have some experience there. Investing primary markets, right? Mm -hmm. So let's start first. What's the difference? What's the primary market and what's the secondary market? Well, primary is um, everything that's before a TG. So before you launch a token, you have investment rounds, um, usually pre-seed, seed, series A. Mm. And um, usually it's on either just token or token and equity. Um, uh, well, equity and token. Um, that's the, the preferred format. And I would say that's where um, all projects start. You, st you start with just primary market offering, uh, to VCs and then you do TG and then that's when retail investors can can take part. The big things about uh, primary markets is, is is usually where the, the the big money is. If you want to do insane multiples, um, and if you invest wisely in the bear markets, that's usually where you get the best deals. And then usually what happens with like all of the projects launching on Binance is they had super early rounds. Uh, by the time you launch, investors are up potentially up to 100x. Mm -hmm. And then retail investors buy in. And then um, at some point in the cycle, then just um, because they are vested and locked, as, as you get unlocked and invested, um, then you just, you know, sell. And that's, I think that's a big part in how retails get wrecked is um, just, it's a dumb fest of just VCs just <laughs> dumping on you at the end of the day. Do you think it's possible to make a lot of money in primary markets in crypto, given how it's, especially at size. The reason yeah. I'm asking that is I had uh, Arthur Cheong, the founder, CIO of Defiance Capital. Mm -hmm. He's done a lot of that. And he, they, they, built, they raised a new fund. Yep. And he said, we're going to do 100% liquid token fund. I don't want to do anything with this primary market because it's not that much of a good deal. And he has amazing well, deal flow, right? Yeah, well, it depends on what... Uh, this time of the market is definitely not the right time. Um, you have to, because you're locked invested, like time horizon of investing is, is pretty much like three, four years mm. uh, to get your tokens fully uh, uh, unlocked and invested. Um, the thing is, if you lo follow the normal um, cycle time, it, you're not going to have the full bull run to invest your tokens. So that part of the cycle is definitely more interesting to raise a liquid fund. Now, if you were actively raising in the bear market, you know, in the depth of the bear market, uh, 2022, but like first part of 2023, that's where you have the big, de the big deals. Like you get the, like Athena, for example, you get these deals, Monad, um, then what's interesting is also when you get those deals early on, then you can sell before you unlock. So you sell your claims or you, you, you do OTC deals. So you don't have to wait for the whole markets to, uh, uh, well, the whole vesting periods to, to, to go. It's, it's like a lot of projects are actually just selling OTC their claims. Um, so if I had to raise a fund now, I would definitely do liquid because I think that's where the opportunities are. But if we go into another bear market, that's where I think the true opportunities are. Is if you get, and you only need one deal, like one large deal where you can put in size. Because um, if you want to do a 100 X on a 1 million placement, doing it liquid is going to be substantially harder than doing it on primary market. Mm. Um, so yeah, going from like, I don't know, evaluation from like 50 million to 
5 billion is something that's completely doable in the primary market. Mm -hmm. Secondary market, doing investing in a token at, at 50 million and it going to 5 billion is substantially harder also because it's, you know, there are issues with equity and all. Hey, when shift happens, family. Time to toast our partner, Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. Let's talk about Xborg a bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we are here today. <laughs> Why did you choose to build a gaming protocol? You've, you've, you've touched about this when you mentioned Luca uh, from Pudgy. Um, there are a lot of uh, great infrastructures. We, we're building, it's pretty much like you're building a whole city and you're building the, 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 the plumbing of that city and the, the highways. But you have no citizens or you have no, no cars. And... Um, to me, if I look at mass adoption, um, I truly, you know, we've discussed a lot about trading and meme coins, but I truly believe in, in, in crypto as a way to empower individuals financially. Um, they are 40% of the population that's uh, unbanked. I think that's, crypto adds so much value in that regard. And so to me, gaming is going to be the big catalyst. You know, we talk about AI, but AI is... Um, you know, it's still a very big buzzword. Mm. But gaming is such a huge, huge space that I think the the path to mass adoption of crypto is likely going to be a gaming. We saw the big announcement from Telegram with USDT becoming natively on the chain. That's going to be huge, but gaming is going to be changing the lives of so many people. And that's why, to me, gaming was very important. Is To me, the, it's the way in which you make, or you're able to make the most impact in the space. And, um, and that's, that's why I think gaming really um, interested me is bringing the next millions of people on chain is, is truly something I'm, I'm interested in. How do you build a leading gaming protocol when you have no idea about gaming? You know, I was, I was a big gamer uh, still. Like uh, 12 to, when I was 12 to like... 16, 17, gaming's been a big part of my life. Um, I, I used to, like, yeah, play a ton of games. Call of Duty has been... I was pretty much antisocial. And, um, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, gaming, I still you know, do like gaming, but... Um, How much did you improve on the social side? <laughs> <laughs> well, crypto does not make it easier, you know? <laughs> That's uh, sure. Crypto, gaming, and... Um, <laughs> But like, imagine crypto and gaming together. My yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, you feel, you know you 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 can quickly just spend your plus trading. You know, trading is very antisocial. Um, it's hard to go out when you have huge positions open. But um, you know, I, okay, just just a parenthesis here, because it's so we talked about that with Irene Zhao. She was trading since two months or three months on leverage, obviously, you know, <laughs> leverage is ahead of a drug. They call it like worse than crack. Um, she was saying, man, I can't even take a plane anymore. Or I take a oh, plane yeah. to connect to the Wi-Fi. I'm going completely crazy. So you said, you know, when yeah, you're yeah. trading with your position, you can't go out. Yeah, no, Tell I, me a bit um, more about that. Like the, I mean, the I, negative aspect of, okay, maybe you make good money at some point yeah. because you understand, oh, but yeah. there is I've, a lot of costs in your life. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, um, I was the first to be a victim of this. Like now, like I, I did tremendously well up to now. Um, like I, I, I never thought I, ha I would have all of that. Um, and I still look back at it. We had a small dump. So I also came to realize, it, okay, that can go. Mm. But um, downside of of being in uh, in crypto and I was doing a bit of leverage is, yeah, um, afraid of being uh, on, on a plane. That's, 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 that's a big one where I was on Emirates and just the, the Wi-Fi was not loading. And you could just see me just trying to refresh and I go to the portal and it was just simply not working. And... Uh, when you don't have a project, 
that's fine. Um, I guess your mental health take a, take a hit. But when you have a project and you know, now we have like 25 people within the team, I'm accountable. Um, you know, I have to be there. And, and, and like, to me, it's just super silly. But one good example is um, we were at my apartment with the girlfriend. And I thought, okay, let me order a massage for two. You know, you can do it on the app. And uh, you know, imagine you have a portfolio value of like a million um, within, and I was I was on average um, within like ten minutes, portfolio went down. So if you imagine a million it went down to seven hundred thousand. Mm. So ten minutes minus thirty percent, thirty percent drawdown, and I was just you know panicked and I was uh, feeling very ashamed because girlfriend is here. So it's not really what you want to show. It's terrible. And the yeah. the, the the massage uh, ladies came in. Uh, and I said, yeah, you can just go, like, go. I, I'm not going to have this now. I was just panicking. Um, so that's the, um, the downside. And I guess I'm not very proud of this. And you learn every, every step of the process, you learn. And then uh, you also learn to take a step back at it. Um, and I think and, uh, the worst part is most people, they come in, they make a lot of money. They become very stressed. Uh, like when, uh, yeah, the red flag is when you want to go to the Wi-Fi so bad on planes because you want to check how you're, you're doing. It's usually a time to go out uh, and to, to exit the market. But usually people just end up losing the money. So they, they, they work super hard for like a year or two. You stress a lot. You destroy your yeah. mental health, physical oh, yeah. health, your relationships, all for nothing. At the end, if yeah. you do like the, the sum of everything... Maybe well, you you even maybe you were even below what you started with, right? Yeah. Well, I had a. Um, it's not a good friend. It's just uh, you someone have one, I know. You have one in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> Who experienced he, that? He was. Um, <laughs> yeah, like last diverging events, lost 120 million, and uh, that's all he had. He was cross margined on uh, Bybit, mm. and. Um, yeah, big wake down, and you're down 120 million. That's um, and uh, and then yeah, just uh, so that's why I say it, you have to be very humble because even even if you're like leveraged, like 2020 COVID events, if you were leveraged by what even 20 percent, like let's say you had like spot position and then you collateralize that in leverage mm-hmm. with like I don't know. 20% uh, premium, like on top of your spot position, mm. you would have gotten liquidated. Mm. Um, that's how it was. And uh, that's why now I'm just, um, my profile has become at least now just risk off. Um, so just spot, I, I don't I don't look at it so much. Because mm. um, I, I want to ask, like, how do you trade while building a crypto project at the same time? I um, It's almost impossible. I, I, I study... Uh, Every, I guess, just every morning. It, it doesn't take so much time. Like most traders, they just lose time looking at the at the market, looking at graphs. My view is more. I've I've never taken short term short term bets. Um, it's always been well short term, as in day trade or trades within the week. I always look at the big narratives and look at the big cat- cat- catalyst, and I try to understand where the flow of capital will go within that period of time. And for example, when I look at uh, memes that you know were going to rally, that's when I went pretty much all in on Pepe, and mm-hmm. that's where I made you know, most of the money this cycle. And then same for me, actually, best return from Pepe. <laughs> yeah, that's just, I, I had the best run of my actually of my life on on Pepe. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, what's important is just studying where the flow is, because today. The money is going in a direction where everything moves in sp- specific sectors. So AI is going to do well, meme is going to do well, um, NFT is likely going to do well, gaming is going to do well. So you want to know where, like mm. what the rotation is. So every morning, it's it's a matter of 10, 15 minutes. Look at, okay, what's the, what are the people saying on Telegram, Discord, uh, Twitter, and then it's just catching up, usually at lunch, just opening, see how it's doing, and then and then evening. Um I have I do very high conviction I guess bets but more medium term like I positions I have open now are like 
been open for like last two weeks. Um, on leverage. I, yeah, but I don't do. Um, we could discuss more about the the setup, but I don't do. Um, usually, what I have in spots is also what I have in in, in leverage uh, at the rate of one of one. So if you have a portfolio of a million in spot, I would have the same amount in in in, in perpetuals, and that's how I increased. Um, I guess market volatility by by hundred mm. percent. So if, you know, let's say you have a, a million in spot in Pepe, you characterize that you have a million in perps. Um, so if you would technically you know, not get liquidated unless there is a big event. Um, and I was very lucky not to be in that I setup. would say, which happens every, yeah. at least six months. Yeah, so yeah. they are obviously, <laughs> you have to be leveraged where, when others are not. Um, so typically you can look at like open interest to look at, um, okay, how hated the market is. And I'm, I'm never leveraged when the market is. Like if you have crazy funding rates, I'm never going to be um, risk on. So mm. there are only particular times where, for example, like three days ago I had this setup because the, ma the market was tremendously down. Um, but now I will start, as prices go up, I will start to be a bit more risk off. What is Xbor What is Xborg if you had to explain it to a mother? Um, it's your... It's your... You have your CV in real life. CV is what represents your, what you've done, professional like professionally, the companies you've went through, the achievements you had. But there is no benchmark for it online, and um, in gaming specifically. So what we do is we building your online CV. So whatever you do online, the number of games you've played, the number of kills you've 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 made on a specific game that we. Um, we combine in, into one specific tool, which we call the Xbox ID, which is your online CV, if you want. And then we build ecosystems that, uh, where your ID is integrated. So, you know, if you want to invest, for example, into a specific um, gaming project, well, because you have this ID, you're whitelisted for certain opportunities, whether it's investment opportunities or whether it's NFT mints or whether it's just simply giveaways. You know, we believe that the next generation of experiences in the web will be one where it's very customized. So where mm. the developer won't be treating you as a, just one of um, many customers, but you as a unique customer. And we're providing the tools and infrastructure to do this. Why is it so valuable to have an identity online. Well, and who is it valuable for? And can you give some examples concretely yeah. on why would certain game developers or game yeah. AI, cater to a certain type of users? Yeah. Well, AI is uh, is, is is playing a big role in this. Is um, AI is redefining who's um, who is who online, and that's why you have projects like uh, World ID, for example. Um, with the, the famous world coin could discuss about this on a tangent but um, it's uh, it's a proof of identity it's proof of personhood and, and when you are a game developer one of the um, biggest hurdles you have is bots like fighting bots fighting cheating is a big issue mm. so having an identity and a reputation layer is very important because if your identity is tied to your profile, you know, okay, this person is legit because he has such and such accounts connected. He's played this many games and uh, different communities vouch for him. So I know as a game developer, okay, this person is legit. Uh, he's not abusing my game. You have all the examples, like when you run esports tournaments or just, you know, casual tournaments, uh, same, like bots and, and cheating is, is your main issue and integrating with protocols like this is hugely beneficial. Also, for example, when you're, um, let's say you're building an FPS game. What's that? Uh, like a first person shooter game. So like a uh, Call of Duty, mm. it's just basically your job is to kill people in game. Um, when you, as a game developer, build that game and when you have new gamers, players coming to your platform, you don't know anything about their history. 
So you can't really target them. Like let's say you do an email sequence, uh, you want to do a giveaway, you don't really know them beyond within the closed circle of your game. Um, so think about all the experience you could give them if you knew that they were some of the biggest FPS players in Counter-Strike uh, or, or Call of Duty, which are amongst the best FPS games. You know, this person is super valuable. And that's why we got a ton of tractions on like either game developers or esports teams that want to integrate with this, or even like just brands that want to um, to communicate with players in a different way. What's your ultimate goal with Xborg? What's the holy grail? Um, as I said, just really keen on the millions of people in the space. Is um, I'm using Xborg as a platform to empower players and. I think the goal initially is a million players that you want to empower, which in normal world is very small. In crypto, that starts to become a big achievement. Um, mm -hmm. And then scaling that to become the biggest, I mean, the biggest and, and, and I guess just prominence, even in the Web2 world, identity system for gamers. That's where I want to take things at. And when you have this identity network that's created, then you can really do some well, really just disrupt the entire gaming market. And that's, I mean, that's completely huge. So you're building a protocol, right? As part of that, I mean, your goal is to build a technology and then find users, mm -hmm. build partnerships. Yep. But there is also a crypto game to be played there, which is the token game, right? Yeah. Let's talk about the crypto plumbing because that's super interesting. And there's not many people who are kind of like open to talk about what's kind of like the truth. Yeah. Luca Nets very open about it, which I really appreciate a lot. Uh, some others, maybe a bit less. So you're listing your token fairly soon, right? Yeah. You went through the whole process. How does the crypto kind of token listing game uh, look like for a builder? And maybe we can take it, I wrote down truth about exchanges and exchange listing, mm -hmm. truth about market makers, truth about KOLs. Yeah. So let's take them <laughs> one by one. Exchanges. Yeah. What's the truth about exchanges and exchange listing? Or maybe if we ask the question in another fashion, how does a project get listed on a big exchange? Yeah, um, so as you said, it's my first project in crypto. I used to be just a market participant, just like anyone else, not a builder. And I think there are only a few people going through this, you know, just the builders or the founders going through this listing step. That's really when you get to understand how it's like to, to be listing there. And then you, to date, that's been my biggest disappointment in crypto, is to understand how this works. Is you... You know, you'd think, okay, you just apply and based on your metrics and based on whatever criteria they would accept you. Um, but it was a very naive way of thinking about it. Um, what I came to realize is crypto, the people that master crypto, like the people that, that guide where the market is going and is to them, it's really just a handful of people. Because if you're here, we're talking about the XBG token, and that's like a small, like that's a, an altcoin. And like any project that's like, you know, you know, below top 20, you're a very small token in the grand scheme of things. And what matters on these tokens is liquidity. Mm. Where is the liquidity today? Is on the exchanges. So the exchanges have a huge power, huge leverage over you. And that's that's why the process becomes so so tough and also quite rigged is um, the truth is like most of the tokenomics you see online today are guided by exchanges. For example, if you come to an exchange and say, and here I'm talking about primary listing. So like um, exchanges do list meme coins every now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, but here I'm talking about, okay, if you do an idea or, launch, or launch pool, how does that work? And um, for example, you would wonder why do all tokens have like 5% floats or 10% circulating supply? It's because exchanges have those requirements where the, the token that launches has to perform well initially. 
And they know that a token is likely to perform better if the circulating supply initially is small. Mm. Why? And, well, that, that that's just basic because mm. the, the the less tokens are available, then the I guess the less tokens you can sell. And if you don't like, if you have you know prices go up just because buy pressure is higher than sell pressure, that's where it comes down to. And so they they want to know, and for the bigger exchanges, they want to know exactly who own, who owns the tokens at the, the initially and they obviously want to get a good share of those tokens initially um, but that's not for all of them that's just only for the bigger one and and so this whole trend of having tokenomics where it's very thin uh, circulating supply and then just grows with like huge inflation that's guided by exchanges you know without this you would have a lot more fair distribution it's just you know, you come to an exchange and they say, you have to do this, and then you quickly do the math and be like, well, that's probably worth it to actually do it. Um, so they, they have different criteria like this, where you have to a bid buy, and you essentially have no choice. Um, or, I mean, your choice can be, okay, I don't list on these exchanges. Um, the other thing that's interesting is it really matters who you know. If you're just, um, you know, if you're, I have some very funny stories there, like um, like an exchange, they refused us and they were like, well, they not refused us, but just did not, did not really care about us. And they were very slow in the process until you get to the right person. Mm. And then within like 10 minutes, the whole process was done. Like spoke to the right person. And then the person that was, I guess, doing the DD, came back to me and was like, okay, we can actually do it. So you come to realize... Is it as simple as just talking to the right person? Uh, well, it depends on, I guess, the governance power. Usually, the governance power is very thin. So it's only a handful of people that have a um, lot of power and like listing power. Mm. Um, and usually, you know, these people can just give some strong nudge internally and, and get it done. Um I saw on Twitter actually someone saying um, no exchanges or no, no no one can guarantee you a, ni- a listing on an exchange. I saw that two or three days ago, yeah. Jason Choi. Yeah, but I think that's false. Um, he said uh, sources eight years in experience in crypto, right? Yeah. Uh, if someone tells you I can get you an exchange by the summer or something like that, it's uh, it's not true. Uh, it, the the sad truth is is it it is um, <laughs> it. it no, well, obviously, you know, the, I think there is a degree of quality of like, yeah, you 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 need to have a certain threshold of like users of traction. Um, obviously, if you're a rug or if your project is bound to failure and you have no funding, that's not going to work. But if you want to be considered, you need to go to the right people. And the issue is, if you don't have the contacts, you just don't have leverage because, yeah. That's life in general, I'd say. Crypto, yeah. non-crypto, right? Well, but even more so in crypto, uh, <laughs> because you only have so many exchanges. Like the 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 top five exchanges, even the top like three, they get most of the liquidity, mm. and the listing teams are pretty small, and so it comes down to just a, a you know, I would say max ten people that you need to be connected to to get on all of the best exchanges. Maybe a word about KOLs, key opinion leaders, right? Which is part of the go-to-market strategy for every project. Yeah. I'm involved as a... I mean, I try to do things very differently, like kind of early investor as a KOL. And I see what's happening in these Telegram groups with all these KOLs. And the founders who basically have to threaten the KOLs, if you don't you know, engage more with our post, I'll just take the allocation back. It's just a shit show. And you see that... The, there's no values in there. No one really cares. They're just like going after 50 different projects. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What What's your take? What's the truth about KOLs? And do you think it's actually a sound investment or is there just no other so, choice? Yeah. So in the current context of, you know, we are in like April 2024, I think this will be regarded as one of the hottest KOL frenzy in the market. I've never seen this um, I invested as a sort of KOL for some time. 
I've never seen that amount of aggressiveness in the market now. It's just crazy. It's like everyone, we did a KOL round with 5x oversubscribed. All of the KOLs, first, the truth is most of them had no clue of who we are. Like they, they invest because of other people. Mm. Uh, and that's the same. Like the first thing that an investor would ask you when you when you go we discuss about prime markets, the first thing they ask you is, okay, who invested? That's the only thing they care about because no one has strong convictions in crypto and that's a big issue. Yeah. Same for KOLs. Like we had have amazing stories of you know getting the best, I was talking to the, some of the best KOLs and well, best as in terms of reach. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, we are Xborg and that's blah, 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 that's what we do. That's the terms. And then they don't respond. And then next message is like, oh, these are the guys that invested. And then somehow they just reply. Um, and that's, that's, I guess, what's happening. But the, there are, there are a lot of, well, first, a KOL never invests alone. Like all of those, you have to review the KOLs as conglomerate of people, just a whole bunch of people investing together. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, like these guys have like those sort of clubs, they discuss about the projects and that's also where they discuss about, yeah, we'll pump this project or we'll fund this project together and we'll rally behind this project or not. It's also what's happening behind behind the scene, which is I think a shame because KOLs do direct them out. Like they do have a, a strong say on, on which token goes up or not. So if they discuss about the project, it's likely going to go up. If not, it's likely going to, well, not do anything. Um, but this payout has been completely crazy. And I think when you say, you know, is it a good investment, like being a KOL today? You have a lot of small KOLs that got trapped in the latest rounds because it was so hot. And the truth is, most projects, they actually give different KOL terms to big KOLs and some to, some, to small KOLs, they give small terms. And none of the KOLs actually know about it, but they, like a lot of- um, It's the same with VCs. I've seen, I've been in calls yeah. with, uh, <laughs> with the biggest VCs where I'm introducing like mega founders to big VCs and I hear yeah. what's there and I'm like, they get like half the price, like discount, it's crazy. Yeah, it's- um, It's just, it's just- uh, and it, <laughs> it's a very interesting game because you have those big exchanges that obviously you have to, you know, you you can't say, yeah, this VC got better, better term or whatnot. But behind the scene, all of that happens. And we, we try to do things in a very fair way. But like, obviously, there are things where, yeah, some of the bigger VCs, they get better deals or... If uh, you want a big VC to come in, they want to get some part of advisory tokens or like some market maker uh, tokens uh, and want to do their own market making. That's usually the truth. But yeah, project like it's 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 been a very like a, a struggle to do this KOL rounds when you have a lot of interest. Um, we we saw crazy offers like. People were willing to pay 3x the valuation that we offered on KOL rounds. And they were, uh, speaking from a founder perspective, they were literally just harassing us to get the, 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 the KOL tickets. And I actually wrote about this on Twitter and it was, that's, that was insane. I've never seen this before. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? Um... I think meme coins are likely going to do well. Um, biggest prediction. How well? Um, Mr. Trader. I think SHIB, you know, you saw SHIB going to, what, 30 billion FDV. I think one of these projects, whether that's Pepe with, um, will hit those figures. Um, I think towards, it's likely towards end of the year, one of them will go absolutely nuts. If market is going risk on, there is no reason for it not to, for them not to do another 10x and that's going to be wild. Um, I think major resets on the KL rounds, uh, you know, I've seen just too much, um, too many things going crazy. So I think that's going to go away. Um, and I think AI is likely going to do super well. Um, like both memes and AI will do very well. And I think if I were to 
position myself if for the upcoming year, I would bet on both AI and memes. The way I look at AI is you have amazing projects going to launch Aether and IO, mm. uh, IO.net. Um, I think these are the ones that you should bet on. Um, you have other projects like Render um, or Akash. These will do incredibly well. And just doing the normal memes like Pepe um, will will be crazy. I think the last prediction I say is Ton blockchain is likely going to be one of the biggest blockchain out there. Uh, so if, I guess, very short term here, but I think they will be crazy, crazy tokens on there. If I had mm. to give a guess on what's the next BSC-like ecosystem, I think Telegram is likely going to be front-running this. Um, yeah, that's that's my my take. Yeah, I think they have, what, 900 million users worldwide? So you potentially yeah. have directly 900 million users, no, users using their blockchain, which is crazy. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's actually one that has actual amount of users. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's very crypto-related because everyone in crypto uses Telegram. Yeah. Amazing, man. Thank you so much for doing that. Well, thanks so much for your time. That was uh, big kudos for, for the podcast you've done. Um, yeah, just keep going. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs>